So let's not get carried away here. Uh, we're not going to you know, double again from here uh, easily. Uh, it's quite possible that markets are going to get some decent returns over the next 12, 18 months. Uh, but it's going to be more difficult than it was in the last uh, you know, 18 months. That's for sure. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart. When today's guest was on this channel back in December, he explained that rising net liquidity was responsible for the surprisingly strong performance seen in both the economy and the financial markets in 2023. And he predicted that these net liquidity inflows would continue, leading to even higher prices ahead. Well, here in the final month of Q1 2024, things have so far pretty much played out according to a script. So where does he see liquidity heading for the rest of the year? To find out, we're going to have another very important conversation today with Michael Howell, founder and CEO of Cross Border Capital. Michael, thanks so much for coming on the program today, all the way from London. Yep, great, Adam. Very good to be here. Hey, it's always a pleasure to, to interview you. As I said in the intro here, um, particularly interesting time to interview you here because you, you from your last appearance here, you've been bang on in terms of what's been happening. Um, so uh, I want to get into your latest outlook on liquidity, obviously, because that, that seems to be the, the horse driving the cart here so far. Um, lots of questions around that. But before we get to them, um, I'd like to just kick this off with a general question I'd like to ask you at the start of these discussions. Michael, what's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Well, I think broadly constructive. I think the uh, the background is that uh, liquidity, which uh, in in my take drives most things, is in an upward cycle, and that cycle bottomed in October of twenty two, pretty much coincident with the British gilt crisis. It was uh, the upturn was reinforced by the SVB uh, failure in the U.S., the Silicon Valley Bank, etc. Uh, liquidity has been coming into markets uh, over the course of the last fifteen months. Uh, that's beginning to uh, now spill over into real economies. Real economies are getting, uh, you know, getting a bid. They're getting traction, and I would suspect that what we're looking at is a peak in the cycle, in the liquidity cycle, at least sometime around the end of 2025. Which means that the world economy should have a better second half of uh, 24, and growth should be picking up through next year too. It may not be as rapid as we've done in the past, but I think the inflection is in. Okay, so um, so basically, what I hear you saying is is the the party that is underway still pretty much in the early hours of the party. It's got it's got real room to run here pretty much through the end of twenty twenty five. Am I hearing you correctly? I think absolutely. I mean, the the fact is that the backdrop of uh, of sluggish economies, let's put it that way, and policymakers that probably want to stimulate growth. Is the best outlook one can imagine for financial markets. This is the ideal spot. Okay, so you know you're in London here. Uh, we just had, I think, two economies in London just technically go into recession: uh, UK and Germany, I believe. Um, so I assume you think that that will those be relatively short lived here then, as as economic growth gets juiced by this rising net liquidity. Yeah, I guess. I mean, at the end of the day, what really matters in the world economy is uh, uh, is not so much uh, some of these smaller European economies. I mean, clearly Germany is an important engine, but we've really got to start looking at what's happening in the US and maybe more particularly what's happening in China and Asia. And I think you've just got to look around and look at some of the data that's coming in. The US economy looks pretty robust to me. Uh, I mean, one can sort of, you know, play around with the numbers and get, you know, different takes. But I think broadly speaking, you're looking at a robust economy. And if you look at China, there's every indication that the Chinese economy is beginning gradually to lift out uh, of this sort of uh, of the doldrums that it's been in for most of the last 18 months, two years. Uh, it may not be as rapid a growth as we saw, uh, you know, ahead of the uh, COVID crisis, but uh, like growth is growth and it looks like it's picking up. Uh, you look at, uh, you know, uh, Pacific, Asia Pacific trade volumes, uh, they're certainly uh, beginning to uh, accelerate. Um, I believe I'm right in saying that the Port of LA reported in January uh, a record month. Okay, so we'll we'll get to markets in a bit, but, but just high level um, liquidity. Rising net liquidity helps asset prices as well. And we saw the markets, their bottom was in October 2022 as well. And they've, they've pretty much just had a great ride since then. Um, it's actually kind of been picking up steam as we've we've turned into the new year here. Um, 
Do you see that more or less being the continued trend from here, or is there a danger that the market can get ahead of itself and, and price too much of this this rising yeah. liquidity in too fast? Sure. And sure. I mean, there, like, there's like, always a risk like, like basically, should should people say, "Oh, liquidity is rising, stocks are going to rise," or would you say, "Ah, it's it's a little more nuanced than that"? Well, it always is a little bit more nuanced. I mean, uh, that that's for sure. But I think the broad the broad idea is uh, is there that you know we're in a bull market. Uh, bull markets, uh, you know, last what on average about uh, two to three years. Uh, this one has been running for about fifteen months, sixteen months or so. Um, generally, if you look at the math of this. What you'd find taking the S&P as a benchmark for an average cycle, you should have seen by now about 60 percent, two thirds of the normal gains in a bull market. So let's not get carried away here. Uh, we're not going to you know, double again from here uh, easily. Uh, it's quite possible that markets are going to get some decent returns over the next 12, 18 months. Uh, but it's going to be more difficult than it was in the last uh, you know, 18 months. That's for sure. Now, I think one's got to as well look. Uh, at rotation, uh, markets you know never mm -hmm. stand still. The same sectors don't always lead. Uh, I think what we've got to expect now is that the rally starts to broaden out. That's what one would would expect. It's likely to move into more traditional cyclical areas. Uh, technology may continue to be a runner, but you know technology is always an early cycle mover. Um, you know Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies have clearly got the bid at the moment. They're very very liquidity sensitive. And any inflections you get in, in in liquidity, even in the short term, could cause a, a nasty air pocket there. The concern that I've got in the very short term, let's say for Q2, is that it's a very difficult uh, quarter for the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury to negotiate. Now, the reason for that is that you've got a number of cross currents coming in. Now, without being too wonkish or technical, um, let me just cite a couple of those. One is the bank term funding program that was put in place after the SVB crisis is terminating uh, as of the middle of March in the next few days. Um, banks will have access to that uh, for a year up to the termination date. Um, but essentially what you see now is pretty much what you're going to get, I, I would imagine. So there's not going to be any great impetus coming through on that score. What the Federal Reserve is trying to do is to steer banks more and more to the discount window as a, a source of emergency funding. So clearly that's an uncertainty we've got, to, we've got to think about. The second thing that is upcoming is what's happening to something called the reverse repo program. That was something that was put in place after the COVID crisis. It was basically a way of, if you like, um, substituting for what were uh, then treasury bills in short supply. Uh, a lot of market participants wanted short-term access to high quality paper. Uh, and uh, without, uh, you know, uh, if they were going into the banking system, they were forcing rates below where the Fed wanted. So the Fed basically introduced these reverse repos. They have been a source of liquidity back into markets in the last few months as uh, money market funds have basically taken money out of uh, those accounts and put them into treasury bills directly. So that's been a source of funding. It's unlikely that is going to go on at the same pace. So you've got to read that as, if you like, uh, a, a lack of uh, or a, a lacking of liquidity in the next few months. The third thing is, uh, again, a sort of a technical factor. But again, we've got to watch these things because they're important for investors taking a short term view is what's happening to the, gen the Treasury general account. The Treasury general account is a way of uh, or is it basically an, uh, an account at the Federal Reserve, uh, as the name suggests, held by the U.S. Treasury. It's basically their current account. If the U.S. Treasury sees more tax uh, inflows than it pays out in uh, in outlays, then that account will build up. In other words, the bank account will uh, increase in volume. That is money withdrawn from the money markets. So if the Treasury general account is bloated because of higher tax revenues, that is a withdrawal of liquidity. And seasonally, uh, this the Q2 is normally a big seasonal quarter um, for uh, for that account. So what we may see is a temporary dip in what we call Fed liquidity, the amount of liquidity the Federal Reserve puts in. Now, it's my view, and I'm you know, becoming a, a minority here, but let me state it even so, that I think the Treasury has to start thinking and the Fed have to start thinking about this QT program. Uh, the reason for that is that QT is running on. It is withdrawing liquidity from markets uh, progressively. 
Uh, so far, it has had no net effect. In actual fact, bank reserves have managed to climb despite um, the, uh, the QT program. And that is because of some of these other factors that I've just mentioned. The Federal Reserve, in terms of its recent speeches, is sounding quite cavalier about the size uh, of Fed liquidity and bank reserves. It's saying it's quite willing to allow bank reserves to dip. I think that's hugely dangerous. I don't think it will get that far because the one thing that uh, Janet does not want to see is another SVB during an election year. So I think they're going to be extremely cautious. And I think the debate will start to swing to how they can start to slow down um, the QT program. And I think what we I, I would envision is basically rising Fed liquidity through the year. But this coming quarter may be a little bit tricky. So uh, the trend is up, but uh, we may go down before we go up is the short answer. OK, and that's actually really important. And I was hoping that we could get into this, which is that when you say it's sort of going to go up over the next two years, it's not just a, a straight line up on a 45 degree angle. It has its wiggles and its ebbs and flows. And when it does ebb, we could see things that are highly sensitive to to liquidity. Correct. Get it get impacted by that. Correct. All right. Um, all right. So many places I want to take this. Um, so I guess first off, while I ask this next question, I know you've got a bunch of charts uh, handy there, Michael. Yeah. Could you bring up the one just of liquidity right now? I think you've got a chart of of how you measure liquidity um, and uh, you compare it to Goldman's financial conditions index. Yeah, this. Oh yes, okay. Let me let me do that. Here we go. Yeah, this is that's the one right there. And, and then we'll go back in a second, and and I'll just have you remind folks sort of how you are calculating liquidity because it seems every expert I talk about has their own little unique variations on it. Um, but we can see very quickly quickly here um, that the way you track liquidity, your global liquidity index, which is the orange line here, did indeed bottom pretty much, you know, right around the end of 2022. And it's basically been a straight shot up and it's still continuing to go up. So we're not seeing any any reversion uh, or reversal of that yet. Um, so uh, I guess if, if there's any comments you want to make on, on this, I'll let you. But but I, I do just want to note the commentary you just made, which is, you know, we've been told that we're in this tightening cycle and that the Fed is doing rate hikes and that they're doing QT. But at least for the past year and a half or whatever, that hasn't really mattered because it's just been it, it's been um, drowned by all this rising net liquidity. Correct. Correct. Absolutely correct. I mean, the, the, the quiz has gone up for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that. Um, a concept we call Fed liquidity, which, as the name suggests, is created by the Federal Reserve, has itself been rising. And I can go into that. Uh, I should say that the orange line on this chart has been advanced by six months to show that it's a leading indicator of the Goldman uh, Financial Conditions Index. Um, so what we're suggesting here is that there's still a lot of uh, momentum in the orange line. It's still, you know, it's still winging its way up. So that's clearly a positive sign. The other things one's got to throw in here is that the other sources or some of the other sources of liquidity globally are things like the People's Bank of China. Uh, China has been easing pretty aggressively for certainly at least six months, if not a tad more. But uh, they're trying to get the Chinese economy stimulated. And one of the things that you know, we've been observing is they seem uh, a lot more willing now to allow the Chinese yuan or renminbi to devalue against the US dollar. Uh, that was a line that was set in stone through most of 2022 uh, and part of 23. And that, that now seems to have, uh, have gone. So the Chinese are more than prepared to actually stimulate their economy rather than protect their currency. Uh, the Bank of Japan is equally uh, adding liquidity. I've been very sceptical uh, against the consensus view that the yen is likely to see a rebound um, either last year or this year, I think the yen is a fundamentally weak currency because of this very loose monetary policy. And I can't see the yen rallying significantly. And I think the Bank of Japan, despite all the uh, the rhetoric about they're about to tighten, they're about to tighten, is going to keep, keep the, the money, the money uh, taps open. So I think that, you know, what you've got is a generally a global picture of liquidity expanding. Now, what I can show you, maybe in a, uh, I'm going to come to a, a heat map, is this heat map, which you can uh, hopefully see in, uh, on the screen, mm -hmm. is what all central banks are doing globally. Now, this is impressionistic. Uh, each of the little tiles there is showing 
uh, a central bank in a particular month. So you've got uh, all the list of the major central banks worldwide shown on the left hand axis there. Uh, they total about 90 different central banks that we monitor. Um, uh, this is not weighted by size at all. It's just giving a, a flavor as to what is going on uh, bank by bank. And the timeline is on the top, beginning in 21 and moving out to uh, latest value is uh, January 24. And what it shows, I think, impressionistically, was that if you look at the middle of 21, that's when policy was easiest, where you've got that big green splodge in the middle. And then basically by um, what about the, about uh, sometime around about the end of 2022, uh, what you see there is a significant red, red splodge suggesting that uh, central banks are very tight. And that's that's the backdrop. That's pretty much what's been going on since that time. You can see that the uh, the mosaic has begun to change colour. The hues have moved uh, much more towards the green or orange end of the spectrum, suggesting that central banks are beginning to add liquidity progressively uh, and collectively uh, into markets. Uh, and that's that's what we're seeing. Um, you know, as they say, if it's if it's yellow and quacks, it's a duck. And it seems to me that it's quacking pretty loudly right now. <laughs> so there we are. Um, just on the question of the Federal Reserve, uh, let me try and nail this this point. What you've got here is a chart that is showing uh, the Federal Reserve balance sheet, which is the red line um, that is measured on the le uh, left hand scale. And that's shown in billions of dollars. So what you've seen is a Fed balance sheet, which peaked at around about nine trillion and is currently edging its way down to about seven and a half. So there's been a very slow decline. But what that uh, red line shows is actually the QT program. Uh, there was a step up at the time of the SVB crisis, you can see uh, visually there. The dotted line that I've shown on the graph just below the red one is the originally slated uh, QT program. So you can see how much we've veered off that already. But clearly that red line is still going down. The more important line is the orange line. The orange line is measuring the net liquidity injections of the Federal Reserve into US money markets. So in other words, this is the, the net footprint, if you like, uh, of the Federal Reserve in the markets. And that orange line is clearly inflected and going up. And that's why, that's why financial asset prices have gone higher. Now, what you can see uh, as well, as I've extrapolated through uh, mid-year, uh, what we think Fed liquidity could do. And there is that nasty step. That nasty step uh, where liquidity goes up but then comes down is almost entirely accounted for by seasonality in the Treasury General account uh, because of the tax inflows that we would suspect through certainly beginning through April. Uh, and that that's really the, the essence of that. But, you know, we need to put this in context. And to put it in context, we've got to take a longer term perspective. And I'm just going to go back to uh, looking at an earlier chart. This chart here is measuring global liquidity. Global liquidity is a concept that uh, I came up with many, many years ago when I was at Salomon Brothers uh, in the mid to late 1980s. Uh, it was a concept that evolved because the markets were becoming international. They weren't just US centric. Uh, there was a world outside of America, particularly Japan and Europe. And you need to understand uh, credit creation, if you like, or liquidity creation in the wider world economy. So we came up with this idea about global liquidity and the the metrics, uh, you know, been pretty much, uh, you know, pretty much intact ever since. I mean, the, there's been a few refinements to the definition, but broadly it's it, it's on track. It really comes back to the whole philosophy that Salomon Brothers used to used to have pioneered by Henry Kaufman, which was taking a flow of funds view of markets. And it's that flow of funds dynamic which really embeds itself in this global liquidity cycle. Uh, what you can see here is a cycle that has a frequency of uh, seemingly 65 months. Uh, that seems to be a pretty regular movement. Um, as a heads up, I first sort of fitted that red line uh, to the data series in 2000 uh, by using uh, a Fourier analysis for those that are interested. And it's been extrapolated ever since. So, uh, you know, what you see is what you get. It's not it's not a fitted line, uh, certainly over the last 20, 25 years. But it seems to be repeating along that same uh, that, that same sort of uh, period or, or cycle. And what has happened is that the global liquidity cycle bottomed pretty much on cue in late 2023. And it's been rising uh, ever since. And this inflection is absolutely on track with what we'd expect to be happening in markets. Now, okay. um, so, everybody so, so says, Michael. 
Just Sorry? real quick, you, you said it bottomed in late 2023. Did you mean 2022? Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. A correction. I stand corrected. 2022. Uh, exactly. Uh, October 22. I should have said 22. Um, the uh, Everybody seems to argue that this investment cycle that we're in is a very um, abnormal and a very unusual one. We would say that's wrong. It's a very normal cycle. Everything that you're seeing, with one exception, and that is the le level of U.S. Treasury yields, is what you'd expect uh, in a normal cycle. Treasury yields look to us way too low. Uh, term premium, which again is a wonkish concept, unless you're a bond investor, uh, seem a, a negative, and they shouldn't be. Uh, and there may well be some nascent yield curve control going on by the US authorities, namely in the form of uh, uh, issuing an awful lot of Treasury bills uh, over the last six months, which is uh, probably a major distortion of the, uh, of the fixed income markets. Just to reinforce the point that we're in a normal cycle, this is how we view the global liquidity cycle from an asset allocation point of view. What the liquidity cycle is showing in orange is a lead of the economic cycle by around about 15 months or so. And again, I would suggest that's pretty much on track because if you go back to when the liquidity cycle inflected uh, in October, roll on 15 months, we should be getting an inflection now, around now, uh, in the world economy. So that looks to be pretty much uh, on track. And the blobs, if you go back and look at this, are basically yield curve inflections, which again seem to be on track. The um, Sorry, I'm going to go to this, this chart. This is just something which I think is worth dwelling on for a moment, which is saying, you know, what phase of the cycle are we in? Now, we're in the early phase of the upswing. Um, in other words, from the trough through to the midpoint of the cycle, that is what we label as the rebound area. And you can see on the uh, traffic light diagram in front of you that we basically show on the left hand side asset classes and on the right hand side industry groups. Mm -hmm. The four seasons, if you like, of the investment cycle, rebound, calm, speculation and turbulence are labeled there. And in the rebound area, what you'd expect to perform and what I should emphasize here is this is not uh, a sort of fitted uh, data set. This is what history shows on average uh, in uh, in these cycles. So, you know, this is a cross check, if you like, to see whether we're in a normal cycle or not. And you what, what you would normally expect during the rebound phase is that in terms of let's look at the asset classes, equities, credits, commodities, bonds, uh, bond duration, you'd expect equities and credits to be the big outperformers during the rebound. That's pretty much what we've seen. Many people were skeptical, particularly about the credit markets, uh, certainly about certain areas of the equity markets, but they've been proved wrong. And both those asset classes have been strong performers. Commodities have not been good, uh, but they may be coming to their own soon. And I would argue bond duration is not a great area to be. And I think there's a distortion in the bond markets anyway, but certainly we're now seeing the bond markets selling off. As you move to calm, what you'd expect to see is equities continuing to, to motor. You'd expect credits to really, you know, not necessarily underperform and not be, not be great performers. Let's say the shine comes off credits. Commodities take their place and you still want, you don't want to be in bonds. And then if you look at the industry groups, what does that tell you? It says that you really want to be in rebound in cyclicals. You don't want defensives. Uh, initially, you want technology stocks. Uh, that's they will likely to be the leaders. But as you move towards the calm phase of the market, as liquidity gets, you know, gets a lot more momentum behind it, uh, technology keeps going. Financials and energy start to come through as uh, uh, as other assets. And I would suggest you know, looking at the big U.S. bank stocks like JPM uh, as a good bellwether of financials doing well. So fascinating. And I just want to take a pause here and note for viewers who are always you know, looking for me to to ask, I usually ask this at the end of the conversation, hey, where do you think asset classes are heading? You're giving your answer right here and you're giving it very visually for folks. So uh, folks right now, just to just to reiterate, um, Michael sees us in the rebound column here. Um, and Michael, uh, I'll, you know, I'll let you come back on this program anytime you want going forward when you think we're entering a new phase or there's anything else going on liquidity that you wanna highlight for folks. But just to ask you to sort of guess here a little bit, if you think that this current cycle is going to last through the end of 2025, around mm -hmm. when would you expect us to hit calm? And then would the end of 2025 be speculation or turbulence? 
I think the end of 25 is more likely to be moving towards the turbulence phase. Okay. Um, uh, you know, I mean, no, no, no cycle is, is truly normal. I mean, there are clearly nuances. One's got a, one's got a guide. I mean, one of the reasons for looking at this uh, traffic light system, Adam, is really to get confirmation of what phases we're in. So if you start to see financials outperforming and you see energy stocks beginning to get uh, traction, then that's pretty much confirming that we're in this calm phase. You're in calm. And yeah. if you start to see uh, commodities beginning to lift off, that's again a further sign. But all I'd say is that come back to the point, this is not an abnormal cycle. This is a very normal cycle. And the distortion is in the bond markets. And because the distortion is in the bond markets where U.S. Treasury yields have been artificially depressed, that has caused the yield curve to give a false signal for economists. And uh, that's the that's the bad. Uh, it's not uh, it's not the fact that the cycle is different. All right. Well, let's let's dig into that just for a second. So. Um... Uh, why do you feel that yields are, um, treasury yields at least, are, are lower than you think they should be for this this moment in the cycle? Is it literally due to intervention? I mean, you, you mentioned earlier it was it was the treasury, a big contributor was the treasury selling a lot of short-term debt here, but is it sort of a form of yield, yield curve control on behalf of the U.S.? Well, I think, I mean, that's that would be my reasoning. Uh, what you've seen is an abnormal swing towards Treasury bill funding, which has created an artificial shortage of coupon uh, supply, particularly around the 10 year tenor. And as a result of that, what you've seen is is term premium have been unusually depressed. Now, I think one's got to say generally that um, there is a shortage of good quality coupon supply in the world economy. And that has been the case largely since the global financial crisis. Uh, and I would again say it's been artificially constructed by the authorities because what they've done is they've uh, forced banks and insurances to hold a lot more safe assets. Now, there are not that many safe assets uh, it, truly in the world economy you can choose. You can think of German bunds and you can think of U.S. treasuries and then you're sort of uh, scraping around to think of good quality uh, safe assets. So what they've done is artificially created a huge increase in the demand for those types of assets. And as a result of that, bond term premium have been depressed. Now, what I show on this chart in front of you, just to explain that, is the orange line is the 10-year Treasury yield. Um, and we show that in terms of uh, uh, the level and uh, a 200-day moving average. But below that, I've extracted what is called the term premium which you might take as a, as a risk premium on treasuries, but it's really, it's a measure of uh, the interest rate risk uh, or compensation of the interest rate risk of holding a treasury. Now, what that reflects beyond anything else is supply and demand for bonds at that tenor. And what you can see is you're beginning to see a very clear inflection now in that term premium. It has been depressed uh, for a long time, certainly through 2021, 22 and part of 23, and it's now beginning to turn higher. And that is a danger sign. And what is driving that term premium higher is a shift away from bill finance towards more and more coupon supply. Now, this chart here is trying to demonstrate that point from a longer term perspective. And what I show here is the net supply of duration, if you like, um, duration just being here a uh, uh, a measure of uh, coupon supply. In other words, the supply of 10-year treasuries, 20-year uh, uh, treasuries, 30-year treasuries, et cetera, longer dated bond issuance. And I've looked at that relative to the term premium. Now, the black line, which is the supply of duration, is a, uh, is a percentage change year on year of net supply. And what I've taken into account of that, I've stripped out what the Federal Reserve itself is, has been buying, uh, etc. Now, what you see, I hope or hopefully what you see is quite a decent correlation, maybe not perfect, but a decent correlation between the term premium and the growth of net supply. Mm -hmm. What we're facing uh, worldwide, but what we're facing in the US in particular is a significant increase in the potential supply of coupon debt. And we uh, and unless they introduce a new Basel IV or some other regulation on the banks and the insurance companies, uh, what you've got now is not the same uh, step up in demand that you saw in the wake of the GFC. Uh, that 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 coupon supply has got to be taken up by the private sector. 
unless the Federal Reserve decides to ditch its QT and come back for another QE dose. But that's really the problem. Now, if I go to the math here of debt, this is the thing where you've got to hold on to your chairs because it's looking very scary. Now, these, let me stress, are not our data. They come from the Congressional Budget Office. Right. The Congressional Budget Office is a bipartisan organization. Uh, it is uh, deemed to be neutral or independent, and it's giving what we would say are pretty decent or uh, acceptable, plausible uh, estimates of what's going to happen to U.S. debt. Now, what I would say uh, as a caveat is, number one, is that I think the CBO numbers are conservative. Uh, I was Secondly, going to chime in and say they're usually government projections are usually wrong on, on, the, in, on the in the air towards the optimistic side. So you're saying, correct. yeah, uh, but this is what you see here is the, you know, those projections. And the second thing that I would say is that they don't take into account another recession. And what we know in recessions is that debt jumps. So it's bound to be too low. Now, what you've got here is a chart that goes back to 1800. This is the public debt burden. It is scary. Look what happened to Britain uh, in the 1950s. Now, that may be a great benchmark because the British economy has never been a great performer since that time. Uh, it's quite possible, and this is the interesting uh, you know, part of the debate, that those levels of debt are sustainable. We've seen that after all in Japan. Japan can sustain high levels of debt. They can be funded. The problem is it comes with costs. Debt is an encumbrance for the economy. So what you get are bad effects from too much debt, such as slower growth, such as embedded inflation, et cetera, such as maldistribution of wealth and incomes. All these things, negatives, come from high debt. And this is what the US has got to avoid. So what you see here is the public debt burden. Now, one of the things that, that we argue, which is a point to ponder, is that debt needs to be refinanced. And debt doesn't stay there in the system. It has a term. So if you issue a five-year bond, in five years' time, you've got to refinance the bond. If it's a two-year bond, you come back even sooner. If you've got the luxury of a 30-year bond, great, because you can wait 30 years before you've got to refinance it. But the average amount of uh, the average amount of debt in the world economy is 350 trillion now, with an average maturity of five years. So my math says you've got to refinance 70 trillion of debt every year now in the in world financial markets. World markets are no longer new capital raising mechanisms for capex for new spending. They are essentially refinancing vehicles for existing debt. They're being swamped by the amount of debt that needs to be rolled. And you need liquidity or balance sheet space to do that. And what this chart here is trying to say is that if you look at the long run average since 1980, the debt liquidity ratios remain remarkably stable. So if you look at a rising debt to GDP ratio in the world economy, you've got to think of a rising liquidity to GDP ratio. And that's the key point. So if liquidity rises, it has consequences, it has spillovers. It can spill over into asset prices. It can spill over into Bitcoin. It can spill over into high street inflation. But it has costs. And that's why investors need to think very carefully about asset allocation in the medium term. Because if you've got this monetary inflation going on, as essentially central banks are, uh, are buying debt, they're allowing liquidity to expand to increase the refinancing capabilities, you're going to get more and more monetary inflation. And the scary data is this sort of thing. This is the data from the Congressional Budget Office, which basically shows net interest payments in red and the primary deficit uh, of the US economy in orange. So add those two numbers together, that is the public deficit. So what we're rolling on now, we're, we're at 6%, but we're trending at a, onwards year after year after year at rates between 7 and 8%. This is unprecedented. And basically, what you're looking at is a rising debt to GDP ratio, as the gray line says, uh, in the US economy. Now, what has the US economy done wrong here? And the answer is that mandatory spending is just skyrocketing because of aging demographics. So Social Security and Medicare are taking up a larger and larger part of the public purse. And you can see here in this chart, which again is Congressional Budget Office data, is basically showing mandatory spending climbing in the brown area, discretionary spending, which has clearly been bloated recently, 
um, you know, by the uh, by the Inflation Act. But I mean, this is again leveling at high levels. Uh, net interest payments, the bit at the top, take a bigger and bigger slice of outlays. But the numbers that we put on top of each bar are reflecting the fact of how much mandatory spending outpaces discretionary spending year after year after year. And this is showing that this number climbs. Now, the bottom line here, in my view, but hopefully I'm wrong, um, is what are the implications for Fed liquidity? Now, if you if you say, well, OK, the Federal Reserve has got to take up some of this debt and maybe it's got to take up more debt than people are accepting. And in fact, even the Congressional Budget Office is assuming that the Federal Reserve takes up some of the debt. And you can see that in the baseline that we've got there in brown. Our view is that it's required to take up even more because in particular, what the CBO um, have in their uh, projections is low defense spending. And I think defense spending has got to go up. So what you've got here is a, pro uh, is a uh, projection of Fed liquidity, which is what's important for markets, that basically triples between now and 2034. That's the big problem. That maybe is what Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are starting to tell us. Investors are getting spooked by this whole threat of increasing debt and maybe rising liquidity in Western economies. And I'm not hitting on the US here in particular because it's the cleanest shirt in the laundry. Other countries are in far, far worse shape. Okay, so let me uh, let me just repeat back here to make sure I got this. Um, you're basically saying that um, because of this massive amount of debt that needs to be refinanced, uh, really every I mean seventy to the tune of seventy trillion a year going forward, um, and potentially at at substantially higher interest rates than it was taken out at earlier, um, that's going to cause a rising debt to GDP ratio. Uh, which is going to be made worse by the the aging demographics here in the U.S. and the the continued rise in mandatory spending, such that to kind of keep the game going, the Fed is going to be forced, or at least feel a ton of pressure, to essentially triple the Fed liquidity that it's providing over the next decade. Did I get that right? Correct. Okay. So I, I think one of the the key conclusions I come to, to from that, and you tell me if I'm right or wrong, is like you said, there's no free lunch. You get you got to pay the price somewhere. Is is the place we really pay the price? Is, is that in the decline of the purchasing power of our currency? Yes, I think that that would be uh, probably the uh, the correct way to put it. Yeah, the value of the dollar would decline. Um, the purchasing power of the dollar would decline in real terms. Um, so let's say against gold or against um, things like cryptocurrencies, that would be my guess. It may well be that the US dollar continues to outperform other paper units. Sure. And I think that's- That's a relative game it. by fiat, yeah. Because everybody has this problem, maybe even worse. Everybody right? has this problem. This is the unusual part about it. But one of the other unusual features is that certainly COVID uh, confirmed this, that policymakers or let's say politicians turn to debt uh, financing of spending rather than tax financing of spending because they just simply can't raise taxes. Uh, whether that is because of popularist pol uh, you know, politics, the fact that popularism is there means that you can't stand up on a, uh, you know, on a platform and say, I'm going to raise taxes because no one's going to vote for you, uh, whatever it may be. But that's the reality. Uh, think of the, the current election in the US. <laughs> None of the... Uh, you know, none of none of the prospective candidates are talking about raising taxes. No, no, and I mean, dear God, right now, I mean, that would be uh, political suicide. suicide. You know, yeah. whether we think that's good or a bad thing, right now, that would be a political suicide for either candidate right now. Um, so, uh, I don't want to draw too much from this, but I, but, but, but I follow your logic, and and that's the conclusion I come to, which is, hey, with a a view of the next decade or so. The, the long-term investor has to ask themselves, how do I keep ahead of, of this um, inflationary erosion of the purchasing power of, of my of the units that my wealth is denominated in, right? Right. Um, right. You said that that Bitcoin might be sniffing this out. I mean, do, do, you, do you think that the, the recent dramatic rise in Bitcoin 
perhaps even the, the current rally in equities. And in the week you and I were talking, gold you know, has, has broken out to a new high. Um, are they sniffing out this story or are they just reacting more in the short term to just rising liquidity? I think it's hard to say, but I think the, the reality is that as this chart that I put up suggests, what we show here in orange is a market cap weighted aggregate of cryptocurrencies and gold in orange. So that's measured in trillions of dollars uh, on the left hand scale. And then on the right hand scale, there is the pool of global liquidity, which is clearly a lot bigger. But um, that rising black line, uh, the global liquidity line, which is which is testing 200 trillion there by 2025, is basically what we call monetary inflation. Uh, in other words, it's uh, it's the amount of credit uh, credit money in the or fiat money in the in in the world economy that is rising. But you can see that in terms of a trend, it looks as if uh, that orange line is capturing it. The point to note here is that the dotted line we put at the bottom is uh, U.S. consumer price, uh, the U.S. consumer price index. So there's a big difference between monetary inflation and high street inflation. And what you know, what high street inflation is com is comprised of is monetary inflation plus what we call cost inflation or cost deflation. And the fact that consumer prices have not moved anything like as much as monetary inflation tells you there's actually been an awful lot of cost deflation um, uh, going on at the same time to keep prices, high street prices down. And that's things like productivity gains. Uh, that's falling commodity markets. That's the China effect you know, et cetera, discounts at major retailers, all these sort of factors are keeping um, high street prices down relative to monetary inflation. But the fact is that that's, uh, you know, a finite game. And at the end of the day, high street inflation will largely match, one would fear, uh, the rise in monetary inflation too. Uh, may not, maybe not one for one. But gold and crypto, which is the main point that I'm trying to show here, are monetary inflation hedges, not high street inflation hedges. So that's what you've got to start thinking about these assets. Now, there are others. Residential real estate looks pretty good historically as a hedge against monetary inflation. Now, clearly, you've got to be careful about where you buy your real estate, um, you know, uh, not necessarily out in the boondocks or whatever it may be. But, you know, you've got to have prime real estate, uh, prime residential real estate. And that tends to be a pretty good hedge. The other one to think about is equities. And I can show you, uh, you know, a chart a little bit earlier on, which tries to show that this is now using weekly data. But it basically shows the path of global liquidity here in orange. And the black line is the S&P 500. Now, one of the interesting points to to note here is um, and there's been a lot of talk, particularly in the in the media in the last week or so, about is this a bubble or is this not a bubble? And I think that one needs to, you know, have a, a sort of sober uh, consideration of that of that point. Um, the fact is that if you look at maybe this following chart, this is the relationship between U.S. equity holdings and liquidity. So, in other words, what I'm doing is I'm taking that data and I'm just looking at the ratio here. And this is the ratio of U.S. equity holdings to U.S. liquidity. I should I should correct myself and say that this is just the U.S. liquidity components, not the global. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that, you could argue, well, maybe the U.S. market is extended. Uh, but then it's nothing like as extended as it was relative to the trend that we saw in Y2K. Um, but there's clearly a risk that it could go down. The interesting point is that if you do exactly the same analysis for world stocks, you find this graph. And this is world equity holdings relative to the pool of global liquidity. Now, what I think is different right now is that many, many global investors are using uh, the U.S. market as their equity portfolio, if you like. So in other words, there's been a lot of money moving into the U.S. U.S. equities now are global equities. They are the they are the prime equities worldwide. Mm -hmm. If you want access to tech or you want applications of AI, you don't go to Europe, you don't go to Asia, you go to America. So America is basically this global equity market. And so what we've got to think about is relative to the pool of global money with foreign money being uh, you know shifted into the US, 
this is still giving a lot of uh, support to US equities. And I can show you this measure, which is measuring capital inflows into the US dollar. And this is a really, I think, really important chart to think about because what it's showing is how cross-border flows have affected the valuation of the market, maybe the, the, uh, the momentum in the market. Ever since the global financial crisis, what you've seen are huge amounts of liquidity uh, winging their way into the US. And that is for a number of reasons. It's basically because uh, the alternatives were not great. There was a Eurozone banking crisis. There was an anti-corruption crackdown by Xi Jinping in China. Uh, we've had the COVID crisis. Uh, we've had US tech, which has dominated the world, et cetera. There's been Basel III, uh, which has forced investors to hold US treasuries. But bottom line is money is coming to America. And even though that chart may be losing momentum, it is still strongly net positive. And understanding these cross-border flows, uh, in other words, taking a global view is really, really important. And I'll uh, leave this thought, which is, uh, you know, many people talk about the, the death of value investing, uh, et cetera. I think value investing died sometime around the mid 1980s because it was when the world economy began to open up and foreign investment became important that these flows of money uh, between between uh, nations, between markets, into reserve currencies, out of reserve currencies became the dominant features in financial markets. And that led its way towards momentum investing. And whatever you know the merits of value or not, if you've got money flow moving into markets, people want large cap stocks. They want indexes. And that's the world we've been in. All right. Um, fascinating. And uh, you should probably expect a fruit basket in the mail from Brent Johnson, the developer of the dollar milkshake theory, because uh, a lot of your charts here, particularly this one, uh, visualize a lot of what he's been talking about for many years, a lot of the crux of his framework. Yeah, I know. I know Brett's work very, very impressive. Absolutely on board with uh, the whole thesis. All right. Well, again, your 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 data is singing in song sheet with with his framework there. Um, all right. Well, um, let's see here. So, uh, what's the best way to take this? So, l let me ask you this. So, um, liquidity seems to be the big dog here that that drives the sled um you see it on average continuing to rise uh for the remainder of this cycle through the end of next year as you mentioned um what what could either cause you to change your view um and if the answer is a different answer you know like what what do you what do you what do you worry about right now cuz cuz right now you you could say oh if net liquidity flows are going to go up for the next 2 years we don't have too much to worry about we know the playbook we'll just go back to your traffic light chart and we'll invest in those things that uh, should do well in this phase um what do you, what do you worry about could disrupt your prediction here well i think one you know let let me give some examples i mean one could be uh, a significant pickup in inflation. Um, I don't think that's likely to happen, but never say never. That's a risk. <clears throat> we could we could see a central bank error. Uh, what I've said is that uh, the Federal Reserve is clearly trying to uh, test maybe the resolve of banks in terms of uh, uh, or threatening to pull reserve levels of banks down to a threshold they call ample. Um, they may get that wrong. Uh, the reason I say that is that the Federal Reserve is very is uh, is forthright in its discussions about ample reserves. The trouble is their estimates um, uh, are, are historically have proved to be very very wrong. Uh, and in fact, in fact, one would even go as far as to say that no one has any idea, uh, in truth, really no no idea what the level of ample bank reserves are. So it, you're sort of feeling in the dark. And you don't want to be doing that too much in an election year. So I think that's a risk. And as I've said, I mean, the cross currents that are affecting Fed liquidity this this year or in the next quarter in particular are sufficiently worrisome that we may get it. We could get an accident. I'm, I may be wrong and you get, you know, a significant tumble in liquidity. That's quite possible. But uh, that's another risk. Um, I think a third one could be in general terms, obviously a, a geopolitical event, but I'm not in the business of predicting geopolitics. So yeah. I, I don't know on that. 
And then maybe fourthly, another Lehman crisis. But I just don't believe the leverage is in the system uh, or the banks are as uh, the banks in particular have, uh, have got uh, inadequate equity cushions in a way that they had before. So I think that the, the regulators have done a fantastic job in the last decade to actually make the, the traditional banking system and to some extent the shadow banks a lot more robust. So I don't think we're going to get that problem. Okay. Um, all right. Well, uh, it's like I said, uh, it's it's going to be fascinating. Um, I, it, it's I, I before I, I think I had you on the first time, Michael, you know, I had I'd begun sort of asking the question of a lot of the experts here. But at the end of the day, does it really does all that really matters or matters or net capital inflows? And should we just not worry about looking at all the other data that folks, you know, obsess over and just watch global net liquidity flows. And you've pretty much come on and done a really good job of making the argument of, of yeah, that's probably all we really should do. Um, and uh, uh, I think you've got to look at this and you've got to look at what the Fed is doing. I mean, those are the two the two key drivers. Uh, and a lot of other things tend to follow. Uh, if investors are willing to put money into the U.S. markets, and the Federal Reserve is continuing to expand liquidity, um, you know, why shouldn't asset prices rise? Because that's what they normally do. And yeah, all and I'm saying is that crypto, which is a really, really sensitive uh, liquidity barometer, we we find that crypto tends to move about six weeks after uh, an influx of liquidity, which is actually, you know, pretty, pretty rapid. Um, that tends to be, you know, an excellent bellwether of whether liquidity uh, is rising or not. And if we're correct that you've got, you know, uh, uh, the 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 sky is the limit in many ways in terms of uh, crypto or Bitcoin. If we're correct in saying that the liquidity background looks as uh, uh, certainly in the U.S. as generous, potentially as generous as we project over the next decade or so, given the fact that the uh, the debt, the public debt burden is likely to be so big, uh, the only way they can get out of it is to monetize. All right, so let, let's talk about this then, because I was looking at your Twitter account right before hopping on here, and and you had a, a quote here where you wrote, "Demographics plus entitlements equal gold and Bitcoin," right? And uh, I think it goes back to the chart you showed earlier, um, but it seems like you think that those are going to be really um, responsive bellwethers to liquidity. Um, let's take Bitcoin first. You brought it up a couple of times as being highly sensitive. And you said sort of the sky's the limit. Um, do you see Bitcoin as a as a really um, credible asset class for investors to consider here, or does it come with some other risks that make you make it a good bellwether, but maybe not a great investment? Well, I think one's got to be prudent in terms of uh, of, of Bitcoin uh, for the simple reason that um, it's not legal tender, and um, the fact is that uh, governments can do nasty things to make sure that. Uh, uh, competing currencies are not legal tender, and one has to go back to the gold. The Gold Act, I think it was in was it 1934 in the U.S., which basically meant gold was confiscated by the federal authorities, mm -hmm. and the fines that were put in place for holding gold were uh, eye-wateringly severe. And uh, that was a, an attempt to basically uh, make sure that the dollar uh, was the, the the main standard of value in the U.S. economy. Um, and it was a, a sneaky way, if you like, of deva devaluing the dollar or creating monetary inflation. Uh, but that's what they did. Now, maybe their ability to police Bitcoin is less good, but let's not stop them trying. And I think that they that's you know one shouldn't have all one's eggs in one's bar in, in in one basket. Uh, start looking at other alternatives. Uh, you know, spread your assets into or spread your money into assets that can benefit from monetary inflation. Uh, high quality U.S. stocks, large cap stocks can benefit. Um, residential real estate, prime real estate can do well. Bitcoin will do well. Gold will do well. So I think those are the asset classes to hold. I would not be in bonds. And that's what I think is the is the the asset class, which is normally a casualty of monetary inflations. Yields will rise. And that's what I think the trend is. We think the trend on the U.S. 10-year Treasury is easily going to test five and a quarter percent. OK. And do you have any sort of general timeline on that? Well, I think my view would be uh, before the end of this year. OK. <laughs> OK. 
And, and let me just ask you real quickly on gold, um, because as I just mentioned, gold hit, hit a new time, uh, new all time high this week. Um, you know, we've had a lot of people mention gold on this program time and time again for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, one of our regular guests in the program will often bring up kind of this decade plus long kind of cup and handle that's been building. And I don't know if you necessarily need to buy into that tech, uh, technical um, pattern or not, but it, it has the big cup and then it has this handle that's made like a triple or almost quadruple top that looking like it's mm -hmm. trying to break out. Could we be at a true breakout moment here for gold? And, and do you expect gold to, how do you expect it to perform relative to the other basket of, of, of uh, assets you just said should do relatively well? Like, is it going to be a, well, a I think I, I'm, performer? yeah, I think gold should do well. I think the fact is that if you look at the sensitivity of gold to liquidity, uh, it has a sort of an equivalent beta or multiplier of something like 1.2 to 1.5 times. So for every 10% increase in liquidity, you get a 12 to 15% increase in the gold price normally. OK, that's the normal maths of how it works. Uh, Bitcoin is about five times that, just to put it in perspective. So if you like, Bitcoin has been acting so far, and I stress the word so far, like exponential gold. Um, but gold is clearly an asset. It's a safer asset. And uh, it will uh, it will still perform well. Um, is this a breakout moment? It could be. And all I would say is start to look around the world at what central banks are doing. Other central banks are accumulating lots of gold. OK, the Chinese in particular. Um, and that must tell you something. Um, they're going to in increasingly put their surplus where they can in gold, gold bullion. OK. Uh, they can't do everything in gold. They've got to buy dollars still. Uh, the whole idea that they won't buy dollars is fanciful. They've got to. But at the margin, uh, they're going to shift away. And margins matter in financial markets. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, look, um, we've got to end it here. Uh, it's always so fascinating talking with you, Michael. And again, I want to give you kudos that, you know, according to the playbook that you have laid out to us so far, uh, things have been playing out eerily um, accurately. Uh, according to it. So um, I, I want to do recognize you for, for being right so far. Um, I also want to, to keep going. <laughs> pardon me? It's a high bar to keep going. <laughs> I know, I'm putting the pressure on you. Um, but as I said, the, the door is always open here on this program. Anytime you see something in the happening, happening in the data that materially impacts your outlook in one way or another, you're more than welcome to come here anytime and, and let our viewers know about it. Um, I've got two last questions for you here as we wrap up. Uh, the first is very important, which is for folks that have really enjoyed this conversation and would like to follow you and your work, where should they go? I think the easiest way is Substack. I mean, we've got a Substack called Capital Wars. Uh, that Substack is uh, is basically open to investors, you know, everywhere. We put a lot of, uh, you know, uh, work into uh, detailing liquidity flows in that and our arguments. So uh, it's not the full story, but it's uh, a large part of the story. And certainly it's useful for high net worth individuals to look at that. Uh, for institutional investors, we've got a more detailed and data driven product. Uh, and that can be uh, obtained by looking at our website, which is crossbordercapital.com. And of course, there's a Twitter handle, which is at crossbordercap. All right, fantastic. And when I edit this, Michael, I will put up the links to those resources on the screen so folks know exactly where to go. Folks, right. I'll also have links in the description below the video too, so you can get there with just one click. Um, last question for you, Michael, and this is something I've, I've started relatively new here. I don't think I asked it last time you were on. Um, we've been talking about all sorts of monetary and financial topics in this discussion, um, leading obviously to you know your, your uh, recommendations on assets to look at. What's one non-money related investment that you would encourage people to consider adopting in their lives? Well, I think art. I mean, I, if you did ask me before, I will give you the same answer because uh, I probably give the same answer to, the, to this question normally. I think art is certainly something people ought to do a lot more of because it uh, brings out this sort of creative uh, energy within people. And I think what's more, it sort of actually forces you to look and observe. And I think that's really, really important. I personally do life drawing. And uh, it's a great, great discipline. Wow, that's fantastic. Uh, so the creative process, uh, maybe next time we have you on, I can uh, cajole you into sharing some of your drawings. I think that would be really fascinating. <laughs> maybe that will be one of the great, uh, great investments to buy and own uh, as liquidity rises here. 
Um, well, fantastic. I love that answer. Michael, uh, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for being so liberal and sharing all the data. And I look forward to having you back on to give us the, the next update in liquidity when your, your uh, dashboard shows that there's a material development. But can't thank you enough. Great. Thanks, Adam. Pleasure to be there. Thank you. Well, all right. Well, now is the time on the channel where we bring in the lead partners from New Harbor Financial, one of the endorsed financial advisors by Thoughtful Money. I'm joined as usual by lead partners John Lodra and Mike Preston. Guys, thanks so much for joining us. Love to hear your recap here of what you took away from the conversation here with Michael. Great conversation as always. Uh, let's see, Mike, why don't we start with you? Really enjoyed uh, the talk by Michael Howell, Adam. He talked all about liquidity for, uh, it seems like for Michael and his work, it is all about liquidity, for which he says bottomed in October of 2022. And he showed some nice uh, graphs. He showed the global liquidity index. It seems to go in a five to six year cycle. Using that cycle uh, length, it seems like uh, Michael believes liquidity is going to peak at the end of 2025. So here we are at the beginning of 2024. According to him, we have two more years of the wind at our backs. Now, it is, it's difficult for us because we have some disagreements in how we measure opportunity here, I think. You know, the talk from Michael and the, and the graphs he showed said it's all about liquidity, and it has been all about liquidity. Partially, that's what's been frustrating for anybody that's questioned this narrative. Anybody that's cared about valuations has been frustrated by this rising tide lifts all boats situation that we've been living through. I didn't hear Michael talk much about valuation and I'll be the first to admit it hasn't mattered. And we've been very conservative and some would say very early being conservative. We have to admit we're, um, we have underestimated just how much this liquidity could push things and how far and how much of a blow off top we could see one after another after another. And we're in a, another blow off top right now, which we don't even think is done. So it could it could end at any time, though. That's the difference, I think, in that our work on valuations has us extremely concerned. And we think that the market ends up a lot lower than where we are now, probably 50 percent lower than where we are now. What we can't tell is where the top will be. I don't think there's any way in the world we get through all of this year and deep into next year before this thing rolls over. And the charts that Michael showed said, it, you know, based on the work that he's done and the things he looks at that. He thinks that they will. So that seems to be a key point that we disagree on. I'd say this market might pop a little bit more over the next few months, but I think it rolls over and crashes before the election. I really do. I don't really have any definitive proof because nobody can prove what will happen in the future, but valuations are so insanely out of whack. The market has been narrow still, although it's starting to broaden. It's true. Um, but, you know, valuations are just not going to support us up here for, for very much longer. And I don't think throughout the end of 2025. Uh, Michael did say that maybe in, uh, the second quarter we might see a pause because the bank term funding program is wrapping up. Reverse repo is slowing and the Treasury gen general account is going to have a big quarter probably with tax receipts. So that might suck a little liquidity out. Yeah, I don't know. We really can't fine tune this much. Again, our best guess is the market might go a little higher and then roll over hard. What we haven't seen is that vertical spike, that absolute uh, FOMO, fear of missing out wave that we've seen in past market tops. We haven't seen that yet. And my guess is we might see more of that in the next couple uh, couple months. So one or two other things uh, that he said that I thought were important, then I'll wrap up. If he was relatively negative on bonds, he thinks that yields will go up maybe as high as 5 5.25% uh, by the end of the year. Yields hit 5% on the 10-year back in October. That was uh, TLT. If you look at the ETF TLT, which owns long-term U.S. government bonds, that reached around 88. Um, but we'd probably see TLT around 86 or 85 if we reached 5.25. We don't think we're going to go that low on TLT or, or, or that high on yields. Uh, we would get more constructive and maybe add a little bit back more to our position if we saw 4.5 or so. But we're down around 4.1, I think, right now as we speak. And that that may be it. That may be it. So we're, we're more constructive on bonds than Michael is. He also talked about gold and gold and Bitcoin, particularly gold, high quality stocks, and residential real estate. 
some of those things we think will do well, particularly gold. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about gold later in our discussion here. Gold has actually broken out of this giant base we've been pointing out over and over again, and it's, have, it's having a second day here above 2100. So it's very, very constructive. And as Michael points out, China has been buying prolifically and continuously. So uh, with that, I will say that we have our differences, uh, but in the near term, I think that we can't deny that liquidity has pushed this market much further than we think it deserves to be. It might go a little higher, but ultimately we think it rolls over hard and it does so this year. All right, good summary, Mike. Um, yeah, it's gonna be interesting. <laughs> if, if Michael Howell is right, uh, it's gonna be a challenging year for folks such as yourself who challenge a couple years for folks such as yourself who track fundamentals and valuations so closely and um we'll talk about a bit this this a bit later maybe when we get to the gold part um i just want to remind us all here that um because of the amount of debt that's currently in the system and the fact that that is um sort of uh deflationary contractionary to growth in and of itself um michael really hammered the fact that that um the the government has a need to refinance 70 trillion of debt uh per year going forward um i think that's the global economy um and uh if you look at the rising debt to gdp ratio uh projection over coming the, the next couple of decades and you look at the horrible demographics that we have in terms of aging populace shrinking uh cohort of the key 25 to 54 year old workers. Um, Michael projects that the Fed is going to need to increase liquidity by three times over the next 10 years. So like if you've hated what liquidity has done to um, the logic of valuations, how it's deformed them, if Michael's right here, <laughs> we could see much more deformation going forward. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that that asset prices are going to shoot the moon, but but probably but at the same time, it means that purchasing power of the currencies that these assets are are uh, measured in is, is going to go through the floor. So anyways, um, maybe again, we talk more about that when we get to the gold section. But um, John, let's bring it to you here. Anything else, any other color you want to add to what Mike Preston here just said? Yeah, sure. That was a great, fascinating talk, as always, with Michael. And Mike did a great job, and, and you, Adam, in, in summarizing that. I guess I'd like to just tease out a couple of things. I, I, I want to acknowledge that Michael um, Howell uh, presents a, a somewhat of a different definition of of liquidity. Um, thirsty people out there, analysts, you know, want to make it real simple. They think of liquidity as, you know, what are interest rates? Is the Fed doing QE, QT, or whatever? And Michael, I think, properly um, paints a much more complicated picture as to the, what this thing called liquidity uh, is. And he he, he his construct uh, looks at, and I, I got to be candid, I don't fully understand his contract. I don't think he gives quite the detail that I certainly would like to know more about. But he, he generally talks about it in the concept of balance sheet capacity, how much balance sheet capacity is there out there in, in the private sector to to take in liquidity and do stuff with it. Right. And and that's where I'd certainly yearn for a lot more detail. And and I, I point to, um, you know, the, the, the bank uh, regional bank crisis that happened last spring. I think it was last spring. Yeah. And um Spring of 2023, and 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 that is an example. So at the, at the heart, what that ca what caused that is banks weren't lending. There were plenty, of, and they weren't lending to to the private sector because there was no demand on the private sector. The private sector had plenty of capacity to to borrow, but they didn't want to borrow. They they were uncertain about the future. They didn't want to borrow and lead it up on debt. So what banks did instead is they they bought treasuries and mortgage securities at really low interest rates. That effectively is lending. It's just lending to the U.S. government or, or the mortgage-backed mortgage agencies versus lending to commercial real estate or industrial businesses looking to, to grow their business. Um, so I, I, I like to politely challenge this concept that if there's capacity in balance sheets, it automatic, automatically means liquidity finds finds a home. I, I, I don't think it's quite that easy. Um, and And in in kind of segueing from that, I think I'd like to just talk about this this uh, I think simplistic notion that many are are tempted to to take a leap on and 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 think of of liquidity as this this thing coming into the market you know the so called cash on the sidelines or or this wall of stuff coming into the market and and by by doing so driving prices up there there is no more widely propagated fallacy than this concept of things coming into or out of markets cash on the sidelines. Because in grand total, um, it's just 
things changing hands. So for example, when cash goes into the stock market, um, the people that part with their cash to buy stocks get stocks. And guess what? The people they bought those stocks from now hold that cash. So it's what it really speaks to is the psychological fervor by which different investors um, chase certain kinds of assets. And that is an app, you know, as much as we are fundamentally focused on valuations, we cannot deny that psychological fervor has a tremendous impact on markets, especially when you get in blow off top kind of episodes, which we think we're in. So I just want to caution folks, especially the kind of clients we work with that they're not out there to, you know, uh, advertise um, mutual fund returns or hedge fund returns. They're out there to, to build a secure financial retirement. Um, recognize that this is this is largely psychologically driven, not fundamentally driven, and it can turn just as quickly when the psychology changes. So it's really important to kind of keep that that in check and, and understand the, the basic premise there. So I'll, I'll stop there. I'm sure there's many more, many more things we can dig into. All right. Um, so uh, let's see here. Uh, I, I, I get a lot of requests for folks to come on the program. One name that's been getting suggested a lot of late is Darius Dale, uh, because uh, coming into Q1, you know, he walked us through uh, his charts. And for those that have seen my interviews with Darius Dale, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I think he packs more data per interview than anybody else that I interview. Uh, and uh, he was very bullish, said he was about the most bullish he's ever been coming into Q1. Um, and uh, lo and behold, his predictions have largely played out. Um, I think that interview was done not that long after the last interview I did with Michael Howell, who was also very bullish in Q1. And they have very different methodologies, right? Michael's is all around liquidity, the way that we're talking about here. Darius's is based on literally like a zillion different indicators uh, that he tracks and uh, he synthesizes them all together and then creates a dashboard and it tells him whether you know, it's green light, yellow light, red light. It was bright green. Um, I just scheduled, so folks should be happy to hear this. I just scheduled an interview with him. Uh, it's not going to be until April, later April, folks, because that's what worked in Darius's schedule. But I asked him, hey, are you still bullish you know, uh, on the markets the way that you were at the beginning of Q1? And he said, pretty much. Uh, and he sent me a copy of his, his latest dashboard. So um, I, I, I do just want to give note to the fact that um, there is a lot of, you know, this market is undoubtedly very stretched, and you guys keep noting that risk. I just want to note that that the recent bulls that have appeared on this channel are still bullish, given these conditions, given the indicators that they look at. Now, what happens in the future? Who knows? Nobody has a crystal ball. That's why we have you guys on every week, John and Mike, so we can track this on a real-time basis. Um, but I do want to note right now that there is still a pretty big divide, you know, at least in in the next quarter or so's you know outlook. Um, from the bulls and the bears, and I'm not putting you guys in the bears per se, but I do know that you guys are, are, are cautious of the markets. Now, you guys have said, and Mike, you said this a few minutes ago, yeah, this this sort of melt up we're having right now, who knows how high it could go. You know, when the markets really get running, they can get crazy and they certainly can go higher than you think and, and oftentimes for longer than you think. But of course, the higher and longer they do, the greater the the pain of a correction if, if, if indeed they have gotten overstretched. So we're, we're going to see what happens from here. But I, I, I just want to note that that even Michael Howell himself said, look, I'm, I'm, I've got this projection for the next two years of, of liquidity still rising. And I think it's largely going to be good for the assets that you noted there, Mike. Um, but uh, but even he himself said, hey, you know, it's 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 going to have peaks and valleys as we as we go over the next two years. And he said, Q2 here is looking like it could be a little bit rough. You know, there's definitely some things that are going to impact the liquidity side of things, uh, shutting off the BFTP, uh, the fact that there's not much left in the reverse re repo program to be drained, uh, the inflow of tax receipts into the TGA that you guys mentioned there. Um, so those are those are mechanical things that are going on that, that should take liquidity out, um, but they potentially are things that could impact sentiment. And that's going to what you were saying there, John, right? Which is, um, it, it's it's almost more sort of an investor confidence, investor sentiment that's driving what's going on right now. So if there's something that goes on that cools animal spirits, um, that might be the thing that kind of ends the party in this current rally. And, and there's, you know, there's a number of issues that, that Michael Howe mentioned, but there are other ones too. And, and Michael said, hey, look, you know, one question that's out there is, will the Fed let bank reserves dip? Right. I mean, if that did, that could really be 
a game changer. Now, he didn't think Yellen would necessarily want to have that happen in an election year. And I think everybody's kind of confident that they'll they'll monkey, they do whatever monkeying in the system they can to try to keep things supported. But, you know, there, there are things that could, you know, send curveballs to the market or spook people or, or, or maybe, you know, maybe some of these people, maybe they do have different agendas. I, I, I don't know. We'll, 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 again, we'll find out. The point is, is I think the uncertainty is increasing on the mechanical side of things, while at the same time, the uncertainty of just how high can valuation multiples be stretched, you know, that, that we react to kind of on a week-to-week -week basis, um, that's in the mix too. So uh, I'll, I'll hand it back to you guys here, but like, I'm not saying he will be, but Michael Powell could be proven right, where, hey, maybe two years from now, all these asset prices are higher than, than they are today because of liquidity flows. But there could be massive drawdowns along the way. And I think that's one of the things, and John, you're nodding pretty vigorously as I'm saying this. I think that's what you're trying to protect people from, because as you said, you know, people people don't retire for a year or two. They retire for the rest of their lives. So you really want to avoid those drawdowns because they basically steal years from you. You know, they, they can yeah. steal years from you. Well, that, that very much is the way we think. And we think in terms of probabilities. Of course, we have our convictions, but uh, any any good understanding of probabilities is there's a probability you're wrong, right? It's just a matter of degree. And as confidently as someone as Michael Howell or Darius uh, Dale might talk about their bullishness, I guarantee you, if you ask them point blank, uh, what's what's the probability? They, they wouldn't give it 100% probability. It's just not the way things work. We we have to be humble. Um, so so too in our approach. So we have to, and, and our, our we have tools to, to address that. So for example, we can be more invested in equities right now, and we are, that we otherwise would want to be or, or would justify based upon fundamentals. But we can use tools that uh, allow us to have upside, but also protect downside. So for example, in, in client accounts, we have um, we have exposure to the, the equal weighted um, S&P 500. And the way we have that is through we're, we're long call options. We bought call options in the money call options on a, on a breakout uh, last fall, breakout to the upside. And um, what that what a long call option effectively is, I'm going to keep it real simple here, but is, there's detail. It's essentially equivalent to, to buying stock, buying our, uh, you know, the equal weighted S&P 500 and simultaneously buying a put, a, a put option to protect downside be, below a certain line in the sand. That's financially and synthetically the same thing. Um, just yesterday, we were able to um, push the strike prices of those those call options up. We basically took about half our, our 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 profits out of out of that position, and by pushing the strike price up, and I'll show you what we're on a chart here, just to kind of give it some living color here. Um, this is ticker symbol RSP, which we own for for clients, um, and this is not a recommendation uh, uh, to 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 anybody. Um, certainly, I can only do that on into live spaces, but we bought. Um, RSP right around here on this breakout. And we we, we bought a, a 145 strike price right here, which is where that breakout was. Okay. And just yesterday we rolled out those those options to the 155 strike, which is right right around there. Okay. And we were able to um take it, you know, sell the existing uh put uh calls for uh excuse me, I'm gonna quiet my phone here, um for twice as much as we paid for the new calls. And we were able to keep about 80% of the equivalent stock market upside exposure. So it's a way to, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a real way, what this does is it raises our safety net to a, a closer to the current market level. And we've similarly done, done things like that over recent weeks with our, our put options. Uh, we have some put options on the S&P and we're in some you know other sectors and things like that. All, all to say is we are investing in the stock market more than we otherwise would would probably want to just based on fundamentals but we're doing it with with tools and belt and suspenders to to protect against those kind of very real drawdowns that can happen in a out of thin air uh, in, a, in an environment like this great i really appreciate you walking through that you guys have done that in previous shows before but it it, it really underscores to folks one of the reasons why we encourage folks to work with a professional financial advisor because most people they just go long only, right? If they're DIY, they get a sense of like, oh, I think the stock's going to go up. I'm, I'm going to put my money in it. I'm going to cross my fingers. And if it goes up, they're happy, right? But uh, they don't necessarily have the the defensive safety measures that you put in place. And if the market turns on them, they eat 100% of the losses where you guys are using an approach that, yes, it might limit a little bit of the upside, but it provides um, a bigger protection on the downside so that they're they're they're, they're 
only experiencing a subset of the potential losses otherwise. Um, that's called uh, risk management, folks, and you hear us talk about that a lot on the channel. I'm coming back to you in just a second, Mike. Real quick, though, on, on this topic of things that could you know, sort of change market sentiment, um, I'd like to get your guys' thoughts on uh, the uh, testimony that Fed Chairman Powell just gave today. Um, I mean, he largely kind of reiterated uh, the message that he's said in the past, which is, hey, we're not going to stop fighting inflation until it's down. You know, we got confidence it's going to be down in the, the 2% range that we're hoping for. Um, but he, uh, I think the language he used this time around uh, rate cuts was, he said, we, we, we still are expecting to do rate cuts, quote, at some point in 2024. Um, so, you know, I think his guidance to the market beforehand had been a bit more confident, a bit more vigorous. They'd been guiding to three rate cuts initially when, when he kind of surprised the market back in, in, uh, mid-December. Um, you know, the, it, 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 the market assumed the rate cuts were going to start relatively soon, perhaps even in, in March. Um, and at one point the market was pricing in something like seven rate cuts. And I just want to share my screen here real quickly. Um, this happened all throughout last year, but it's happening again where the, the, the market keeps having to readjust its expectations of uh, the Fed's rate cut schedule. It has, to, it has to keep walking them back. So you'll see here in this chart, uh, on December 14th, when, when Powell dovishly surprised the markets, um, you, know, you can see where the, 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 the market was expecting the Fed was going to you know, really pretty quickly and dramatically get rate, rates down over the next two, a year and a half or so. It then had to move that up on February 2nd, then had to move it up again, meaning fewer and fewer rate cuts uh, in late February. And of course, that, that chart's probably going to adjust upwards uh, even higher today after the Fed's uh, testimony that it just gave today. So, you know, we're, we're in this back in this world where the market just, you know, keeps trying to get ahead of the Fed and the Fed keeps having to say, nope, guys, you're getting too aggressive. You're getting too aggressive. So, um, who knows what's going to happen there? But at some point, if the market really begins to doubt that the Fed is not going to be that generous this year with with cuts and or easing, which I know the market has speculated a lot about, that's something that could really force the reevaluation of, of some of these valuations, especially now that they've gotten they've gone on such a tear since since Powell's initial dub of surprise, you know, back in in December. So, John, you're nodding as you're yeah. saying. Yeah, Adam, just a couple of quick data points. Uh, end of last year, the market was pricing in about an 88% probability that the Fed would cut at the March meeting, this upcoming March meeting. That is now down to a 5% probability, okay? Uh, at the end of last year, they were pricing in a literally a 100% probability of, of some level of cut by the May meeting. Now, if you look at the CME FedWatch tool, that's down to a 25% probability. So the, so the market has definitely recalibrated uh, the expectations there. And it's something we called out all through the end of last year, the, the, the divide between the market and the Fed. And we're going to talk about gold in a bit. Mike's going to cover some, But I just want to point out, you know, gold's breakout to recent all-time highs is happening in parallel with these rate uh, expectations becoming much more sober, which is really another supportive thing for uh, how for gold interesting yeah. gold gold you know typically higher rates is bad for gold so the the fact that the gold breakout is happening with this recalibration of expectations on cuts or no cuts or timing of cuts is really i think another stealth bullish um thing that this breakout in gold is probably a real deal so we'll talk about that later all right well we could talk about it now mike uh we'll head over to you and obviously feel free to add anything to what john and i were just talking about there in terms of curveballs that could surprise the market but as John said, you know, gold is um, uh, is finally performing the way that you have been, you know, guiding us to for a long time. You've you've shown that sort of decade plus long cup and handle. Uh, we we're finally visibly above that triple or quintuple top that had been forming, right, in the handle. Yes, thank you, Adam. It's a few things I'd like to say, and then I'll get to the gold question. Uh, Michael talked about debt to GDP. Um, Debt to GDP right now is about 120%. In fact, if I can, I'll share the screen so I can show you. This is the St. Louis Fed website. Debt to GDP in this particular chart goes back to 1970. Um, ironically, roughly right around the time that Nixon went off the gold standard. Uh, it's been steadily up in a relatively you know calm slope. But of course, after 2008, all bets were off. And we're presently up around 120% of GDP. You can see that number right here. 
Michael says he expects debt to GDP to, to maybe reach 250%. And just looking at my notes here, yeah, 250% by 2050. That's insane. That's insane. I think you asked the question, what happens? What are the negative consequences? Does your currency get hurt? Well, while we actually believe that Brent Johnson is probably right and that the U.S. dollar uh, system will be like a vacuum in the early days of a financial crisis, long term, we may see some negatives for the dollar. And certainly, if we go to 250 percent of GDP, we'll see some negatives for the dollar. And then on one of the charts that Michael put out there, he said, well, look at what the U.K. did in the 1950s. You know, they had a, a parabola, just like he predicts that the U.S. will have by 2050. The point, though, is the, the United Kingdom hasn't been a world power in a long time and maybe never will be again. Who knows? It's hard to predict the future. But these kinds of crazy things that governments do are not a good sign. It's not a good sign of early stage growth. It's a sign of desperation. The last thing I, I don't know what will happen, though, is with all of that liquidity, will we just have a nice ride up in assets? I don't think so. You, we're looking at valuations that are higher than they've been in the last 120 years of recorded data. Unless we get an explosion in productivity and GDP, these numbers are not sustainable. We can't just say liquidity is going to push it higher. What we don't know is what the path is going to look like. So I wanted to get that out there. Also, I wanted to make a couple, just a couple notes of things that we're doing, and then I'll get to the gold question. Um, we are short-term bullish. I almost hate to say it. We are short-term bullish. Our short-term indicators are positive. They have been for many months. We've been talking about that. We've been trying to ride up the market the best we can. We're about 40% net equities. We think it's a total gun to the head market that could crash at any time, but there's no technical reasons to believe that that's imminent. And so, yeah, we are short-term bullish. We're taking profits in some sectors that have worked out well for us, uh, uh, insurance and industrials. And we're adding software very soon. We've been looking at that pocket of the tech group. And so we continue to try to, uh, to try to operate there with hedges and continually increasing our hedges so that when we do get a rollover and a crash, we don't give back very much. So our best guess is we go higher and then there's going to be some kickoff event that'll make it hopefully obvious that a bigger decline has started. And that could very likely happen from a higher level. So it doesn't pay much uh, it, it doesn't help or it doesn't pay much to get out early in anticipation of that, particularly when we see so many strong charts still. So lastly, gold. We just talked about gold. Let me bring up our chart of gold in just a moment and gold miners. I guess I'd like to close with that. Gold has a 20-year pattern that's pretty incredible if you look at a monthly chart. And I'm going to hit click share right now. Just give that a second to come up. So here is a monthly chart of gold. This is the ETF GLD. You can use gold itself if you want. This one's easy in our charting package to use. Essentially, over the last 20 years, we had this bull market and then a big sideways consolidation in what you might call a triple or even a quadruple top here. These triple tops don't usually hold. We've been saying that a long time here. But this is a giant base. One, two, three, four. I'm going on the fifth year of a base. So a beautiful chart pattern. A lot of what we do has to do with chart patterns, technicals and chart patterns. We've been expecting this to break out for months now. And so we have a second day with gold above 2100 and it looks to close here. This is a monthly chart and this would have a measured move to up towards 2500 or so. If we look at C uh, silver or SLV in this example on a monthly chart, you can see it's got this big consolidation. It looks more like a triangle. You got an inverse head and shoulders perhaps going on here. If you want to get creative, it might be a little bit of a stretch, but that's what it looks like inside of the triangle to me. I believe we got a break out of this triangle and we got a pretty violent move up towards 30 on this asset. And then I think gold goes towards 2,500 on that chart that we were just there. So let's take a look at GDX, a big ETF that owns gold mining shares to say that this has been a disappointment would be an understatement. It's been puzzling to us why gold stocks have underperformed for as long as they have. Sentiment has been getting very, very bad in the, in the sector. We can tell that a lot of different ways, the people that we connect with. Um, take a look at GDX. It's woefully underperformed. You know, it's way below these previous peaks when the chart I just showed you with gold is at a new peak. So what's going to happen? Is it going to play catch up? Are we going to have a vertical move? I actually think that's quite likely. 
It's a very small sector. Let me go to the daily chart here. And uh, we, this recent low the other day basically touched the October low and came within a few cents of it on this asset. And then it's just been vertical from here. We very quickly recaptured the 50 and 200 day moving averages. And so this type of thing could cover, cause some short covering. I can see GDX going right to maybe 33, 34 in the next few weeks if we get some short covering and gold holds what it's doing. This is the weekly chart. You can see what happens to other weekly time frames. You get three or four weeks straight up. We could easily be back in this range. Longer term, going back to the monthly chart, I think that GDX would be 45 plus if we hold um, 2,500 on gold. Right now, it's it's completely unobserved sector with really bad sentiment. Fundamentals are starting to get better, and um, we're glad we're still in it. It hasn't been an easy thing to hold. The reason we're still in it is because we have been able to hedge a good part of the position throughout this past couple of few years even. So it's been a hard thing, but it's really washed out, very negative, and we still like it here. Um, all right. So it'd be super interesting to see what happens. And Mike, you, you've been telling us to watch this for months and months. So it's it, it, I want to give you credit for calling this and we'll watch it closely as it, to see how it transpires from here. Um, a couple of questions. One is, um, you said that if things go well, you could see GDX, you know, breaking out following the price of gold. Now, the miners are supposed to be a leveraged play on gold. Um, therefore, they should go up materially. W whatever gold does, the miners should head in that same direction, just in, in, in a materially stronger uh, intensity. Um, and so you were saying, hey, if things go really well, uh, GDX could get up to $45 or so from its current price of what was it like around 28, 29. Um, mm -hmm. So I was looking in that chart you showed, well, back in, I think 2011, where we had the last uh, high in gold, um, GDX was in the like mid sixties. <laughs> so the question I have is, um, I, I know you said it's a, it's a head scratcher why they've been so disappointing, but wouldn't you expect GDX to hit a higher price this time around if we did get like $2,500 gold than it did back you know, in, in 2011? You'd think so, Adam, but the truth is that things have changed, right? So uh, the price of gold might be 2,500, you know, which is much higher than it was back in 2011, but the world has changed. Inflation has changed. The cost of getting the metal out of the ground has changed. I don't have the chart at my fingertips, but I can tell you right now, the cost of getting an ounce of gold out of the ground is around $1,200 an ounce. Back in 2011, I, I believe that number was closer to 600. So because of inflation and labor and energy costs and things like that, the the, the whole the cost of doing business has increased. So um, a new high in gold here at 2100 is not equal to 2100 at in 2011 because of all those things. There's been some really bad decisions by management as well, some bad acquisitions, um, yeah, just just some overinvestment in some bad places, some balance sheet destruction. And that all happened back, um, I would say, in the wake of the 2011 bubble. I think that CEOs were overly optimistic and they made some bad decisions. That has a lot of that has been cleaned up. Some of the negatives, though, do remain about this industry. It's politically messy. It's environmentally messy. But it's a very, very small group. And it responds tremendously to a move up in gold price. If gold price is at 2100 and I just told you the cost of getting it out of the ground is, is 1200 or so, that's a $900 profit per ounce. Um, and if you were to go from 2100 to 2600 you know, add 500 to that, all of a sudden the profit goes from 900 to 1400 which is a huge jump percentage-wise, 30 to 40% jump in profit, which flows right down to EBITDA or profitability. And through the leverage effect of how equities are valued, you could see a, a monstrous move. Now, a lot of these equities are trading at high single digit, digit price to earnings ratio. So if you've got a big jump in profitability of 30 to 40% with just a few hundred dollars increase in the price of gold and couple that with margin expansion, as investors start to realize the sector even exists, you could see numbers much higher. We try not to predict, but absolutely, I could see GDX going to a new high. But I'm trying to say what I think is more likely nearer term in the next year or so. Okay. But we'll, so, we'll hopefully ride them higher if they go there. 
so this isn't personal financial advice, obviously, folks, but um, w- would you say, Mike, that now is a looking like a particularly attractive time to get exposure to mining stocks, especially for those that don't have it, um, because we finally have this breakout that you've been looking for. And so if if things progress from here the way that you think, where that that multiplier of of um, from the increase in profitability uh, you know, on, on the income statement of the, the miners really starts to kick in. And, and then Wall Street starts to look at this sector again after having left it for dead. Um, you could make an argument. It's got pretty good prospects ahead of it. W- 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 do you think that now is a, a good time for new money to come into the space, new investor money to come into the space? I, I do, with the caveat that it's not individualized advice. Like you said, we'd have to talk to, to to anyone that's considering that directly if they'd like to have that conversation. But the news has been so bad. The sentiment has been so bad in the sector for quite a long time. So bad that it's good, frankly. And with this breakout, that would, I think the big thing is the breakout in gold. A lot of people were thinking it was the triple top. A lot of people were thinking, oh, the dollar's strong. It's not going to... It's not going to go higher or the Fed, you know, isn't going to cut. It's 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 not going high. Well, here the Fed is saying they're not going to cut. And I do believe the Fed's not going to cut until we see an equity market crash. So the Fed is saying they're not going to cut, as John just talked about earlier. And yet gold has broken out solidly, well above 2100. And imagine down the road, maybe later this year, the Fed does start cutting. Maybe it's in response to an equity market accident. I don't know. With the, with the target rate at 5.25, there's a lot of room for downside. And so you could have an all-time high in gold with an easing Fed after that, and maybe even some other turmoil in the world if it starts to become obvious that the Fed and other central banks really don't have the ability to pull a rabbit out of the hat into eternity. If you start to have a, a loss in confidence that the Fed's going to be able to continue to do this, there's going to be a rush into real things. You know, Couple that with a drop in, uh, in the Fed funds rate and other central banks potentially easing, we could see gold go much higher. I think 2,500 is a first term target. I think that gold stocks, I hesitate to say they could they could easily double from here. If we move up towards 2,500, maybe not on GDX, but a lot of the individual stocks and, and maybe the junior sectors could double from here easily. And, and then some, we'll see. You know, we'd have to, I don't want to predict too far in the future, but I think in the next year or so, I could see gold 2,500 plus. I could see some of the juniors doubling. I could see GDX up 50 to 70%. So take everything into consideration by your own personal uh, situation and tolerance for risk and don't take too big of a position because it's really hard to hold on to. But and this in particular has worn people out to the bone, including us to, uh, sometimes. So that's a good sign in general. That's a good sign. And like I said, we just retook the major moving averages it would be a great time to start edging into it if you don't have a position. Again, what we would need to have an individual conversation with anyone considering to do so based on that advice. Okay. All right. Well, look, um, uh, we got to start wrapping it up here. I do want folks to know that, um, uh, one, to dive deeply into gold, uh, we're going to have uh, Matt Pippenberg, uh, who's a big favorite of a lot of the viewers on this channel. Uh, he's going to be talking about gold at the upcoming uh, Thoughtful Money Conference. Um, the, the bonus video that everybody who registers for the conference gets uh, is going to be Jeff Clark's uh, latest uh, top stock, uh, gold mining stock picks. Uh, so you get that basically for free uh, if you when, when you pay to register to, to attend the, the, the live event itself. Um, and then a question I was going to ask you guys, we just don't have enough time here. Um, is the dynamics of, of a what's going on with with Bitcoin in general, but you know how much of of the attention that might have been going into gold in a non Bitcoin world uh, is getting stolen away by Bitcoin right now. Um, we're going to also have Mark Moss uh, talk about Bitcoin at the conference as well. Um, for those that have been living under a rock, you know Bitcoin had fallen dramatically to a low of I think around sixteen thousand last year. Uh, and has come roaring back this year. Uh, and a lot of people are just beginning to say, look, I, I, I don't understand this asset class, but I, I probably need to start wrapping my brain around it. That's what that discussion with Mark is going to be. Again, that's at the upcoming conference. Um, all right, guys. So in wrapping up here, um, folks, if you uh, enjoyed having Michael Howell on here, I think his uh, perspective with liquidity and its implications is valuable. would like him to come back on the program again in the future please let us know by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. 
And a reminder that the Thoughtful Money Conference is coming up in now less than a week. It's going to be Saturday, March 16th. So if you haven't registered for it yet, folks, you don't have much time left. Get your tickets. Uh, and uh, a reminder for that, too, that um, uh, uh, if you are a subscriber to uh, Thoughtful Money's uh, Substack account, sorry, got to get that out of my mouth. If you're a subscriber to our Substack account, you get an additional $50 off the price of the conference. So if you're a premium subscriber, go get the code before you register so you can get your 50 bucks off. If you're not a subscriber, a premium subscriber yet, uh, you can become one. Only costs $15 a month uh, to do that. So just sign up for a month, pay the $15, save the larger $50, pocket the $35. I want you to get the best price for the conference. Um, and all right, just as we do every week, but I think we did a good job of reiterating it uh, today. <clears throat> um, for most people trying to figure out how to navigate this market, and to do it safely uh, and to take advantage of risk management best practices, um, we highly recommend that folks work under the guidance of a good professional financial advisor, um, one that takes into account all the macro issues that Michael Howe and I discussed, that John and Mike and I have discussed here, and that uh, the other guest experts that appear on this program every week discuss with me. Um, and really, folks, when you you put that those layers of requirements uh, on your selection process, the universe really starts to shrink a good deal. There's a lot of uh, financial advisors out there that, that really don't study the macro side of things uh, the, the way that this channel does. So uh, if you've got a good advisor who is doing all that for you, though, and doing it well, and um, not just coming up with the strategy and the plan, but executing it for you, great, stick with them. But if you don't have one, you'd like a second opinion from one who does, perhaps even John and Mike and their team there at New Harbor Financial, well, then consider scheduling a free personal consultation um, with these advisors that you see with me on this channel every week. To do that, just go to thoughtfulmoney.com. Fill out the short form there. Only takes you a couple of seconds. These consultations, they're highly personalized, but they're totally free. There's no commitments involved in them, no obligations. It's just a free public service that John and Mike and our other advisors offer to help as many people as possible, position as prudently as possible in advance of what may be coming down the pike. All right, uh, gents, thanks so much for spending another week here with me. John, I'm going to let you have the last word this week. All right, I'll keep it short. Uh, we, we we are so fortunate to get calls from folks that reach out to us, and it truly is a low-pressure conversation. we got a great team. You know, I think anybody that reaches out for a, a consultation will find uh, uh, folks not even, you know, our team very skilled and, and expert on several types of matters but uh, very, very pleasant to speak with as well. So we invite you to reach out, um, no pressure whatsoever. And uh, you know, thanks again, Adam, another great uh, conversation. Certainly we we work hard to keep our, our gears and our heads turning to make sure we're thinking about things from several different angles. And uh, you know, uh, this content helps us to do that. All right, thanks so much, John, well said. Reminder folks, sign up for the conference if you hadn't yet. For those listening on the podcast, can't see my overlays, go to thoughtfulmoney.com slash conference. John and Mike, thanks for yet another great week. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching. We'll see, see you soon. very soon, Adam. Thank you.